Hello and welcome to Module 4 in uh, this ongoing online series in Cognition. Uh, this module will be primarily about shorter term versions of memory. In particular, we'll spend a great deal of time on working memory. Today I'm going to introduce uh, one of the um, original models of memory coming out of the cognitive uh, revolution of the 1960s, the Atkinson and Schiffrin model, which is sometimes called the modal model. Uh, it's an information processing model that has been very influential. Um, and certainly lays out um, a way of thinking about memory that will be very important as we move through talking about uh, other ways of thinking about memory and getting to a modern approach uh, to those. But this was the one of the most influential uh, models of memory, certainly, um, ever produced. And so we'll talk a little bit about that. And then we'll talk about the first component of, the, of this particular model, which is called sensory memory, and talk a little bit about some classic research by George Sperling on iconic memory. So we'll start with the atkinson Schifrin model, which uh, is 50 years old this year. Uh, we'll first I want to first talk a little bit about systems views of memory um, versus processing views and give you my spin on the um, distinction, if there is any. And then we'll talk about the atkinson Schifrin model, or the modal model, as it's sometimes called. But let's start with this question of systems versus processing views. And this is less of a dispute than it used to be in the field, but to give you an idea, when we talk about a systems view, we characterize memory as reflecting the system or store that memory resides in. So the atkinson Schiffer model has different memory stores, the sensory store, the short-term store, the long-term store. Uh, and memory phenomena are tied to the specific system. So here we're talking about a shorter term form of memory, a longer term form of memory. And when we get past talking about working memory, we're going to talk about longer term forms of memory and different types of memory within longer term memory. And there's some question about systems versus processing views in those. Processing views are those in which characteristics of memory reflect the type of processing that has taken place, that what is important is the operations that act on information. Um, and so we'll, when we get to talking about longer term memory, and in particular talking about uh, effective study habits, we're going to focus a lot on how you process information as being important. Uh, for my take on this, these are both, they're not mutually exclusive, and they're both probably true. That is, there are different memory systems, and how you process information within that particular system will influence um, how that memory is processed, encoded, retrieved, etc. So these are complementary views, and so we're going to talk about different memory systems, but we'll also talk about different types of processes within those systems. And these are important ways of thinking about memory. But let's uh, introduce the atkinson Schiffrin model, or the modal model. Uh, it is a, uh, an information processing model, that is information comes in and gets processed through memory stores. So we start with uh, sensory memory, so this is a raw copy of the stimulus, and we'll take a closer look at these in a minute. Um, so for visual memory, this is called iconic memory, so you're looking at, right now you're looking at the screen, that sensory input goes into sensory memory. Whatever you're directing your attention towards is um, what you encode, so that then gets transferred to short-term memory. Whatever you don't attend to uh, is lost. So whatever we've directed our attention to then gets processed in short-term memory. Uh, and according to this original view, uh, maintenance rehearsal was an important part of this. That is, if you held on to information in short-term memory, um, so if you can think of this as just saying something to yourself over and over again, um, like a phone number or something like that, that maintenance rehearsal is how things then uh, get kept in short-term memory, things then get encoded into long-term memory. Um, unrehearsed information from short-term memory in this model is lost, and then information is retrieved from long-term memory back into short-term memory, uh, and that's how we process uh, all information is through short-term and long-term memory. So we've talked already about attention, and certainly things that we don't pay attention to, we aren't aware of um, necessarily, um, and things that we don't consciously attend to may get processed to some extent. So there are already a few issues from a modern perspective in this type of memory. We also now know that maintenance rehearsal isn't a particularly effective type of encoding strategy for long-term memory, but we'll get to that later. This was a really important uh, beginning of understanding memory. Uh, so then we get to kind of thinking about each of these sort of stores or systems uh, and their uh, properties within them. And so to preview, 
Uh, sensory memory is just a raw copy of the sensory environment or the stimulus. Uh, Information is lost through just decay. It simply disappears. This is a very brief duration form of memory, um, about 250 milliseconds or thereabout. Um, it has very large capacity. Basically, your entire visual world um, in iconic memory is there. Once you direct your attention towards it, you can find pieces of information, but the rest of it's going to disappear. So whatever is attended to gets transferred into short-term memory. Uh, this is a phonetic code that it's sound-based. We'll talk more about what that means in a minute, but basically, if you think about saying something to yourself over and over again, that's where that phonetic code comes in. Uh, in the original model, information was lost through decay, moderate duration of about 20 seconds, and uh, a fairly limited capacity, about seven items or so. Then information that gets rehearsed gets transferred into long-term memory, uh, which is based on semantic codes, so meaning-based, uh, language-based codes of information. We lose information through interference, which we'll talk about here in a minute, um, and it has a relatively long duration uh, and has unlimited capacity. One of the first things we need to introduce in talking about um, short-term versus long-term memory is to dispense with uh, the sort of popular view of short-term memory. Uh, from a cognitive psychology perspective, anything that is longer than about 30 seconds ago is long-term memory. If it didn't occur in the last 30 seconds, uh, it's not short-term memory. It is long-term memory. Only whatever you are working on consciously or has happened in the very recent past, so less than a half a minute ago, is short-term memory. Short-term memory is not what you did this morning or what you did yesterday. All of that is long-term memory. Anything beyond 30 seconds is long-term memory. So it's something to keep in mind. So as I said, this is one of the earliest models of how humans process information. It's called an information processing model because information flows from one system to another. And so information flows through uh, these systems. <coughs> Now, as we start moving on, we'll see um, certainly sensory memory is a, a thing, um, and we'll see a expanded version of shorter-term memory uh, in later lectures called working memory. And what is seen in this, this unitary short-term memory, is actually part of that eventual working memory uh, model we'll talk about. And then, of course, long-term memory uh, also has a number of subcomponents to it that we'll get into and talk about later on. This is an introduction to um, this basic atkinson schifrin model. That then gets us to talking about sensory memory. Um, and I'll be fairly brief here. Um, sensory memory has some moderate uses, but uh, from uh, an applied perspective, and if you're not planning on going into uh, advanced studies in uh, cognition, this is one of those um, areas that it's, not, it's good to know about, um, but there isn't a great deal of application. Echoic memory, which is sensory memory tied to um, sound-based, so basically your hearing, uh, does appear to have important um, uses in things like uh, sign language translation. So people who are translating sign language have to hold on to sounds. Uh, they have to basically buffer sounds so they can translate them into movement. And it appears that that's happening in echoic memory. So that does have some um, applications. But for iconic memory, um, this is visual sensory memory. It's a raw copy of your visual world. It's extremely short duration. It's less than a second. It's actually less than about a quarter of a second. Um, so very, very um, brief duration. Uh, and I want to basically introduce some classic research by Sperling. It's a very clever design. Uh, George Sperling definitely did some very brilliant research in this area. He's a member of the National Academy of Sciences um, and really has done some, some interesting stuff in this area. So in the first condition in Sperling's, Sperling's experiments, he did what's called the whole report method. Uh, and so this is briefly presented on the screen. Um, it briefly presented and then disappears, just long enough to, for it to appear in um, the visual area, not long enough for the participants to process really anything from this array. Uh, and then they're asked to report as many letters as they can. And they usually got to about four and a half letters, or about a third. Um, before they couldn't report any more. But Sperling thought that perhaps what was happening is this was disappearing from iconic memory too quickly. And in fact, I've posted a link at the end of this lecture. Uh, there's a link to YouTube. Uh, and for those of you in my cognition class, you can uh, 
um, just directly access that link via the PowerPoint presentation. Uh, for those of you who are just watching from YouTube, you can, um, if you'll just go to YouTube and search Iconic Memory Demonstration, you can find a demonstration of this. But what's interesting about this, because I've, I've done this experiment before, is while the array um, shows up and disappears, you can actually still see it. And so um, what Sperling thought is it's just disappearing too fast. And I think that's what his participants were saying. So he came up with this very clever um, methodology where they would be presented with the array and then directed um, to which line they were supposed to report. So a high tone indicated the top line, a medium tone, the middle line, and a low tone, the bottom line. And what he found was that they could remember about 3.3 out of 4. So as a percentage, um, a dramatic increase. They could remember, see most of that line. By the time they were directed to that, they could get most of it before it disappeared. So that partial um, report uh, is a really interesting way to do this. And then uh, he was able to take a look at how long uh, iconic memory lasted by instituting uh, various delays between the array being presented and the tone. And so we can look at those results here. Um, pretty great, about was that, about 80% um, report in partial report with the immediate tone. Uh, by the time we get out to a quarter of a second, uh, we're down to about half of those items, and by a second, um, it's about the same as whole report. So right about here at you know, a quarter of a second is when most of that has disappeared. So then finally, uh, so this is iconic memory, it's visual sensory memory. There's also echoic memory, which is sound-based um, sensory memory, and it's the same kind of thing. You can direct your attention. Uh, if you remember when we talked about pre-attentive processing, um, where you're, you know, basically when you're trying to listen to one voice versus another, um, that's all happening uh, probably in echoic memory as you're directing your attention. Um, so that's our auditory sensory memory. And again, has some uses for things like um, translators and whatnot. So that brings us to the end of this particular um, lecture. A couple of places you can look for more information. Uh, here's that YouTube demo um, for um, Sperling's original research. Uh, this is also uh, on the homepage of Rich Schifrin, uh, who's at the University of Indiana, uh, still active, still doing research. Um, and so uh, certainly take a look at that. Uh, he certainly is still doing some uh, really interesting stuff in the field. All right, with that in mind, that is the end of uh, our first lecture on uh, shorter term and working memory. Next, we'll talk about a classic research in short term memory, including some issues involving uh, decay, interference, uh, and et cetera. So we'll talk about that in the next lecture.